Welcome to the National Autonomous University of Mexico Campus Chicago. I am Erika Erdeli, Academic Coordinator, and it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Murray Kiernan. Uh, he is director of the Carlyle Institute of Latin America. He studied at the University of Cambridge and Cape Town and Dublin. Uh, his former consultant for academic affairs uh, of the World Bank, member of the National Academy of History and Geography of, um, and the National, National Legion of Honor of Mexico, and fellow of the World Affairs Council in Washington. He has authored 11 books and more than 200 articles. Uh, he will address today a very interesting topic of our national history in Mexico that has to deal with uh, allies and enemies of Mexico and the Mexicans during the very turbulent 19th century. Uh, so welcome Dr. Murray and thank you very much for being today at UNAM for this very interesting talk. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. I'm very grateful for this, for this invitation from the UNAM of Chicago doing their splendid work up there in, in, in the United States. And, um, and uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm always very, very interested as an Irishman living here in Mexico, I'm always very interested in speaking about the Irish contribution in many respects to the development, in some cases, even the independence of Mexico, the, the, the great personalities I'm gonna talk about, you know, Guillaume de Lampard and Juan O'Donoghue and other people. Uh, I will be principally talking about the, the Irish Battalion, the St. Patrick's Battalion, uh, which came here in 1846, 1847, and changed sides from the American to the Mexican side. And I will be talking about, as a, from the perspective of a, um, empathetically, empathetically putting myself in their place and trying to work out what an Irishman would feel when he came to Mexico with his, with this, uh, with this um, American army and why, for what reason they would change sides. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting, I think a very interesting psychological case. You know, all the disadvantages um, in terms of fighting for the Mexicans and against the Americans because, you know, their execution was waiting for them, them if they were captured as prisoners of war. And, um, and I just wanted to get into a little bit of the mentality of these people. So, yeah, so I'm very grateful to, to the UNAM um, as a as a person who's worked for the UNAM over the years as a, as a guest lecturer and, and I've given many conferences there and, and I've done many publications with the APA UNAM and so on. So um, um, always a pleasure to work with one of the great universities of the world, the, the National, National Autonomous University of Mexico. Right, modern day Mexico is populated by a number of clearly recognizable ethnic groups who are relatively large in number generally marry among themselves and in some cases maintain a certain measure of distinctive culture and way of thinking that characterizes their race. The Lebanese, Jewish and Chinese communities are good examples of this. Relatively recent arrivals to these shores, their numbers and social solidarity keep them intact as an identifiable group. They have not disappeared in the same way that African slaves, mostly of course men, were rapidly diluted by intermarrying in the area of Veracruz in the 18th century. By contrast, there are other groups who arrived to Mexico in far smaller numbers in different parts of a vast and unpaved land and at diverse times. Most of the Europeans who came to live here did so as individuals or in small contingents, retaining their surnames and possibly their physical characteristics, in a few cases creating their own social clubs and schools the French, the British, the Germans, the Swiss, and so on. Even within this second category, the Irish never, never represented a very large minority. The Irish Mexicans, or we can romantically call them the Hiberno Mexicans, can be separated into four distinctive groups. Number one, those in the 16th and 19th centuries who were born in Ireland, went to Spain or perhaps the United States, and then ended up living in, in Mexico. Number two, those born in Spain of Irish descent who later came to Mexico. Number three, from the 19th century onwards, those actually born in Ireland who as a, as a matter of purpose or accident arrived to Mexico. And number four, those actually born in Mexico and who are of Irish descent. 
The Irish who, who emigrated to the United States of America, Canada and Australia in, the, in enormous numbers, and even those who chose to live in sizable numbers in Argentina, did not often follow a similar, similar triangulated route in order to get their final destination. A brief word could be mentioned at this point concerning the amount of information available about the Irish in Mexico and the breadth of research that has been done on this subject. There is no large central source of information about Irish Mexicans. Indeed, the numbers were never great and one consequence of the upheavals of the 19th century is that less information was actually recorded than in other countries. I will make a comparison which, to my mind, is quite revealing. With its headquarters in Switzerland, there exists a Society for Irish Latin American Studies, which publishes a research journal and has a large quantity of, of ordered data, both biographical and numerical, about the, the Irish, but principally as this relates to Argentina and its neighbouring countries. This is explained by the large numbers of emigrants who, to Argentina and the cyclical communication, accumulation of facts and figures relating to them, particularly since the 19th century. In fact, the breadth of information go back to, go, goes back to before this. For example, there exist details concerning the arrival in 1749 of the Lynch family to Buenos Aires, an action that would lead six, genera six generations later to the birth of the Irish Argentine Ernesto Che Guevara Lynch, Che Guevara, and the overthrow of the Bautista regime in Cuba in the 1950s. So all this is connected. The Irish arrived to this Irish family, the Lynch family, arrived in the late 1740s, and six generations later, Che Guevara Lynch um, started, obviously participated in the, in the Cuban Revolution in, in the late 1950s. In general, the comparatively prosperous Argentina, Argent, Argentina was a very attractive destination for the non-Spanish-speaking European. The process to bring Irish people to Argentina typically involved intermediaries, who, were, who often went to their own counties back home in Ireland and enticed their countrymen with offers of land, employment and opportunity for the skilled lower middle class and an escape for the poor land tenants from the perennial threat of famine and destitution. An agent who did exactly this was Edmund Casey, who along with his partner William Orr Gilmore began selling tracts of land in Santa Fe to Irish farmers and others from the 1790, 1879 onwards. A certain organizational structure was already in place six years before. The St. Patrick Society in Argentina had already been established to promote emigration from Ireland. The emigration that did take place is a peculiarly unknown historical fact among Irish men today. By, by 1841, there were 3,500 people of Irish birth living in the still small city of Buenos Aires, mostly from the one county of Westmeath in Ireland, and the number of Irish Argentines had arisen to perhaps 110,000 by 1917. Right, I'd like to go a little bit uh, back to the early Irish, very, very early Irish. There exists a Toltec legend, speaking of a man with fair skin and a blonde beard who taught the Toltec people the virtues of brotherly charity, acceptance of God's will, and the secular benefits of improved methods of agriculture and use of metals. These elements have been teasingly related to the adventures of the Irish missionary, St. Brendan of Art Fert and Clonfert, an argument based on comments expressed in the Novatio Brendani, an ancient Latin text of the sixth, seventh century. The theory argues that Brendan was the representative of Quetzalcoyotl, and the precursor of the equally white-skinned Hernán Cortés. Of course, it should be said in passing that practically the only re religious that, are, that has not been attributed to the well-traveled Brendan is a, is a lunar mission. Quite possibly the first Irish, Irishmen to step onto the continent of America were members of Christian Columbus's, Christopher Columbus's crew, perhaps recruits from his visit to the west of Ireland in, in 1477. There is certainly evidence of an Irishman called John Martin, who was marooned on the Mexican coast with 100 others by the privateer, by the pirate, John Hawkins in 1568, because Hawkins had no room for them. He, he just didn't have enough ships for so many crew members. Um, the same John, John, uh, John Martin, the Irishman, was later executed seven years later as a, I think by the, Spani by the Spanish Inquisition as a British spy. 
During the vice royalty of New Spain, most Irishmen who came to the colony were either priests, soldiers, or colonial servants. As such, they were typically gra graduates of the clerical institutes of Spain or Rome. Members of the military, such as the Hibernia Regiment stationed in Mexico from 1768 to 1771, or former students of the Real Colegio de Nobles Irlandeses, established in 1593. Two individuals are typical of these men. The first, El Capitan Colorado, Hugo O'Connor, was the first commandant inspector of the interior province from 1771, and later governor of the Yucatan, and is remembered today for his military reforms and two general campaigns against these stubbornly recalcitrant Apaches. A pragmatist, he was strongly in favor of employing Indian allies to fight along with the Spanish. The second was the son of immigrants from the south of Ireland, John, John O'Donoghue, Juan O'Donoghue E. O'Ryan, the new viceroy in 1821, who managed the few months of life that Mexico allowed him to sign the treaties of Cordoba, Cordoba establishing Mexican independence in August and September 1821. The honor of being the only Irish, Irishman represented on the Monumento a la Independencia does not belong to him, but rather to William Lamport, author of the first Declaration of Independence, which notably supported such measures, measures as racial equality, land reform, and a democratically elected monarchy, advanced ideas for the early 17th century. And he was also apparently the, the, the model for Johnston McCulley's novel about the womanizing but socially responsible Zorro. This interest in the well-being of the indigenous and the suppressed is a recurring uh, theme in the history of the Irish in Mexico. One instance is the, is the Franciscan priest Juan Augustine Morphy, chaplain of expeditions to the Northern Territories, who had written within 15 years of his arrival to Mexico an especially powerful investigation of the native people Viaje de Indios y Diario del, del Nuevo México. Something of, this, of the same empathetic pressure shown by previous generations of Irishmen in New Spain formed part of the motivation among certain soldiers of the, of the United States interventionist forces of 1846 and 1847 to change sides. The Irish in Texas and Northern Mexico. The regions of, of Spanish North America where Irish people had settled in relatively large numbers where the Louisiana Territory passed from French to Spanish control in, in 1762 and governed by a for a short period by the Irish-born Field Marshal Alejandro O'Reilly and the area now covered by the modern state of Texas. There was some degree of ambivalence among the Irish in terms of their loyalty to their political masters, whether they were the Spanish or later the Mexicans. But it is noteworthy that upon completion of the purchase of Louisiana in 1803 by the United States, and the creation of the new states, new state of Coahuila and Texas in 1824, immigration by Irish Catholics into Texas was actively encouraged. Their cooperation in doing this was assisted by the pressure of Protestant newcomers to this, to this area, animated by racial and sectarian nativist ideas. A good example of what happened during the period involves the Irish settlers who began arriving to the Texan towns of Refugio in 1829 and San Patricio in 1831. Their journey from Ireland to these de destinations was a typical story of disease and shipwreck. A cholera epidemic killed 200 of them while they were quarantined off New Orleans. One of their consolations was the aid that they received from Mexican people and officials. The Irish empresarios or land agents offered each family one labor, uh, which is 177 acres, which is probably 70 hectares of land, if they used it for cultivation, but a far larger area of one sitio, 4,428 acres, if they raised livestock. A further enticement of an additional quarter of the total was offered if they married a Mexican national. The empresario himself was to receive five sitios, approximately 22,000 22, acres, plus five labores for each 100 families he brought. The settlements themselves turned out to be two of the very few agreements that were actually successful at this time in Texas. The son of the former Viceroy of Peru, Bernardo O'Higgins, again of Irish descent, talked from 1823 to 1830 of the importance of a colonization comprising such industrious and brave people, the, the Irish, but as in Chile, his plans came to nothing. 
There are reports that during the period directly after the independence of Mexico in, in late 1821, there was antagonism between some Irish Catholics and new settlers who were Protestant and in favor of the United States. The loyalties of the Irish were finally revealed in the 1835 Texan War. Two of the four impresarios favored um, succession, in other words, joining with the United States, while another, Dr. John Hewitson, we see him here in the photograph, remained loyal to the government of Santa Ana, abandoned his properties, in other words, sacrificed all of his, all of his um, lands and buildings and so on, and went to live in Matamoras. Although reputedly he still died a wealthy man. This forced, this forced exit or voluntary departure of Irish people led to the Mexican Republic partly, um, of Irish people loyal to the Mexican Republic, partly explains the large quantity of Irish surnames, Byrne, Walsh, Foley, Hayes and O'Leary, still found in states like Chihuahua, Nuevo León and Durango. As was said earlier, quite often the Irish quite a, uh, found themselves by the machinations of historical accident in locations they had not originally, originally intended to inhabit. A last chapter in this series of projects by Irish impresarios occurred when a plan was submitted by Father Eugene McNamara to settle 10,000 Irish people in Northern California, the state of California on the Pacific coast. The proposal was again partly based on the argument that they would be a bulwark, bulwark, bulwark against the encroaching Americans and become active players in the economic development of the region. But the Treaty of Hidalgo ending the Mexican-American War in 1849 made this plan irrelevant. Mexico had lost um, the state of California. Right, the San Patricios. As a way of introducing the topic of the well-known St. Patrick's Battalion, I would like to mention some of the military expo exploits of the Irish in Latin America. The poorer people of that island, and even the sons of the wealthier, wealthier classes, formed a major part of the British, British army for generations, and also represented a large percentage of the forces of certain other countries, perhaps as many as half, one half of General Washington's soldiers fighting against English colonial forces in the 1770s were either born in Ireland or were of Irish descent. 50% of his army fighting against the English were, were either Irish or of Irish descent. Soldiery was a source of employment and was motivated, motivated by such basic sentiments as patriotism, empathy for the underdog and financial reward. Irish men per participated in the wars of independence in the 1810s and the 1820s. In 1814, for example, the Navy of Argentina was commanded by William Brown, Guillermo Brown, and, that's, and the Navy of Ur Uruguay was commanded by Peter Campbell, both of them um, Irish. 2,000 soldiers were, were recruited by John Devereux, an Irishman, to fight in Bolivar's army. And the descendants of those who stayed live now in Colombia, Bolivia, and Ecuador. Again, in 1827, the Imperial Brazilian Army, through the good works of Colonel William Cotter, an Irishman, recruited 2,500 men and their families for their war against Argentina. As always, sickness and mutiny decimated the numbers more than the fighting itself. But in this case, it is interesting to note that the survivors chose either to return to Ireland or to leave for Canada. And ironically, their former adver ad um, and quite often they they left to live in their former enemy country, Argentina. On an, on an admittedly small scale, a military diaspora had occurred. Some of the background to what in the United States is called the Mexican-American War, and in Mexico is, is titled the War of Intervention, has already been discussed in previous sections of this paper. The Mexicans were certainly aware that their northern possessions, the scene of much bloodshed, bloodshed against native peoples and investment of treasury, were underpopulated, yet obviously very attractive to an admittedly more entrepreneurial nation, the United States, which clearly recognized the advantages of possessing the ports of San Francisco and San Diego, the, nat the natural resources of, of, the, of Nevada, a trade route through New Mexico, and the vast farming lands in between. As with the intervention of the British, Spanish, and French in the 1860s, the formal reason given the hostilities, given for hostilities, was a non-payment of outstanding loans and indemnities. In light of this grievous omission on the part of Mexicans, the, upper, the offer of, um, of $5 million for New Mexico and $25 million for California probably appeared quite munificent. After all, the, 
Imperial French had previously been seen common sense and sold the equally remote and transparently underdeveloped Louisiana territory previously, as the Russians would later do with Alaska. The Russians also sold this vast area of, um, of their possessions in North America called Alaska to the United States. But the Mexicans were proud that their recently, recently independent country extended deep into North America, that it contained tremendous possibilities that would be plundered in good time. In any case, that stubborn survivor of his own shortcomings, Santa Ana, was back in the presidential palace. All of this acts as an introduction to the famous band of soldiers, the so-called San Patricios, whose ranks, contrary to, to the belief of many, were never more than 60% Irish, but whose ethos and passionate sense of the little man against the bully were characteristically Irish. The soldiers com comprised men born in at least seven different European countries, ex um, ex um, excluding Ireland, plus Canadians, Mexicans, um, Americans, and even some escaped slaves. With very few actual US citizens, it was a small United Nations with bellig belligerent Catholic sensitivities. Though its nominal commander was Colonel Francisco Moreno, its most famous soldier was the head of its first company, Brevet Major John Riley. The practice of recruiting foreigners into the Mexican army is already well established by the opening of hostilities in 1846. 16 foreigners had already reached the rank of general in the Mexican armed forces. Several Irish Mexicans counted among the many Irishmen who eventually would fight in the battalion. There were also young men born in Ireland who were recruited in the, in the southern United States. One can well imagine that their initial entry into the US Army was governed more by the need for income and adventure than from a deep sense of loyalty to the country they hardly knew, whose ratios and against them reminded them of their treatment back home as the inferior race of the British Isles. One should, however, keep in mind that they, they, they did not simply desert the US Army, as so many, so many of us did, they actually went further, ignoring the temptation to disappear into the empty vastness of the Western United States, and they actually defected to the Mexican forces. This is a very interesting point. There is an approximation that as many as between 6,000 and 10,000 members of the invading American army actually deserted. Um, most of them just disappeared into the mountains, into the empty spaces of um, New Mexico, um, Arizona, California, and so on. But what these soldiers did, they actually deserted in order to join and to, to join the fight, fight with the Mexicans against the Americans. In some cases, the mercenary mentality certainly did operate. After all, the Mexicans were offering citizenship, higher wages than the US Army, and a minimum of 1.3 square kilometers of land to each new recruit, all succinctly explained in leaflets in English, German, and French. So obviously, the, the, the Mexicans were tempting these um, the foreign elements, particularly the foreign elements in the, in the invading US Army, with these, with these offers of, of becoming Mexican citizens and vast amounts of land. And, um, additionally, if a man ignored the quite obvious inevitability of US victory and the concurrent ire of military justice, even for non-citizens in his army, then this incentive was important. One should also recall that the human being is sensitive to what he witnesses Especially, especially if he can put himself in the place of the victim. This sympathy was certainly identified as a most motivation to defect by Catholics. As Jack Bauer expresses it, I'm quoting, on, re on reaching Mexico, they discovered that they'd been hired by heretics to slaughter brethren of their own church, end of quote. The leaflets encouraged this sympathy and the impulsive and emotion emotional decision was made by a tiny minority of Irish soldiers in the US Army to change sides. Though in line for a lieutenant's commission in the US Army, John Riley himself lasted only six months um, in the American Army before he was motivated to pass to the, Ameri to the Mexican side, before war was even declared, but at a point at which hostilities would have appeared inevitable. The newly configured St. Patrick's Battalion participated in five major engagements against the Americans. Beginning as an artillery, artillery force at the Battle of Monterrey in September 1846, they were equipped with the heaviest guns that could be mustered, plus two six-pounders they captured at the Battle of Buena Vista in February 1847. They were the main response on the Mexican side to US horse soldiery. However, though they numbered among their ranks men who had served in the armies of other countries, 
their weakness lay in the lack of heavy guns and the pr pr propensity of the poorly trained and officer, uh, officered Mexican militia to engage the enemy with equal tenacity and skill. As highly capable des deserters from the US Army to the opposing army, their fate if captured would have been very clear. There exist records of their stubbornness as fighting men that express both, that impress both um, General Francisco Mejia, um, as well as his US counterpart, counterpart General Winfred, Winfield Scott. But it was a level of belligerence that, could, that would hardly secure their mercy even when they were finally captured. Eventually at the Battle of Mexico City with at least 35 of their companions already killed, about half of the survivors were captured and perhaps another 85 retreated with Mexican forces. 85, the, la the, re the remaining, the last 85 members of the San, San Pedro, Batillon de San Patricio. Courts martial quickly, quickly followed. Their haste to set an example and for vengeance clearly indicated by the absence of both representation of legal counsel and written records. It is an interesting fact that one of the 96% of Irish soldiers in the US Army who did not desert the Irish-born Colonel Bennett Riley presided of the court-martial in St. Angel, prosecuting his, his fellow countrymen. Of those captured, two escaped execution, one because of, of improper enlistment um, in the Mexican army and the other due to insanity. Later, after pressure from eminent people such as the Archbishop of Mexico City and the British minister, another nine were pardoned due to their youth, another, another owing to drink. An interesting quirk of military law in the, it dictated that since they had deserted before the war began, John Riley and several others received a sentence of whipping administered by Mexican muleteers, who were notably enjoined to make their best effort to make their best efforts in this task, branding with a D on the cheek and imprisonment. And D obviously for deserter. As for the other others, their sentence was death by execution. The powerful me message of keeping the condemned men with news with nooses around their necks for four and a half hours at a hanging presided by a man with a reputation for rape and the murder of a, of a slave girl is well known. The repost to this insult, the cheering of the Mexican flag by the men about to die is, is also equally well known. There are so many um, revealing facts about the war as they relate to the San Patricios. It is quite plain that they made scapegoats in a war that often lacked basic military discipline on the American side. The desertion rate in this war was twice as high as that of the war in, in Vietnam, for example. But desertion specifically by Irish soldiers was in fact much lower than the overall percentage. In fact, the Irish are much more alive to the US, uh, to the US flag than, their, than other foreigners in the, in the US Army. However, the San Patricios were the only deserters executed as a group and the perception was created among certain elements of the army that the loyalty of Irish troops was not to be relied on because of what, what the San Patricios had done. One could argue that the fact that they were deemed so, success, so, so successful as a fighting unit and such a, th a threat if allowed to survive is a compliment to them. Interestingly, the battalion was revived by March 1848, but their level of indiscipline as much as budget cuts obliged President Jose Joaquin de Herrera to dissolve the group later in the same year. Their brief, their brief existence, their relative success in battle, and their final uh, sacrifice were hardly noticed in Ireland. At the time, the country was experiencing the Great Famine, which led to hundreds of thousands of deaths and a larger number emigrating. Probably about two million emigrated, one million people died of starvation in Ireland at that time. The scale of domestic misery obliterated all possible interest in the, in the execution of a few dozen emigrants in a distant and unfamiliar land. Mexico, Mexico I, I think, still remembers them and is grateful. Some survivors disallowed from entering the United States appear to have taken up their land grants, while perhaps 20 more had returned to Ireland by the end of 1851. So there are actually very few people of, of um, direct descent from the members of the San Patricios in Mexico. There still are a few, but not, not so many. Right, the later Irish in Mexico. Since that tur turbulent epoch in, in Mexico's history, the arrival of Irish people and the lives of their descendants have been much more pacific. But there was still some opportunity for an Irish Mexican to cause political mischief in Mexico. In his capacity as legal advisor to the state of Yucatan, Justo Sierra O'Reilly declared the state independent from Mexico. 
His now perhaps more famous son, Justo Sierra Mendes, was an inspiration to the ideologies behind the Mexican Revolution and the intellectual father, father of the UNAM. So Justo Sierra Mendes was actually of Irish descent. In the tranquil, in tranquil field of commerce, Eustace Baron, Eustace, Eustace Baron, along with his Scottish partner, created the foremost British merchant house in the 19th century in Mexico. The grandson of the first British consul in 1823, Cecil Crawford O'Gorman, arrived to Mexico in 1895, and one of his sons, Juan, became a painter of the quality and innovation of Orozco, Rivera, Tamayo, and Pablo Higgins. While another son, Edmundo O'Gorman, the, the philosopher historian, became a founder of, of post-colonial research in Latin America. Um, Juan O'Gorman, um, as I mentioned just now, of Irish descent, his father was, was Irish. He's the man who did the, the famous murals in the Biblioteca Central in, in, the, in La Ciudad Universitaria here in Mexico City. Finally, the conclusion I wish to present deals with the reasons why Irish people did not come here to Mexico. A series of eminently practical considerations explains the lack of an Irish, of a large influx of Irish people here. One reason has to do with the cost of the trip. With little or no tr direct transport to this country, the price of traveling here from Ireland would have been a pivotal, pivotal drawback, particularly in the context of more familiar and trusted destinations. There are stories of people boarding ship only to Canada and then taking the train to the United States as this was cheaper than a single journey to New York. The outlay required became extremely important during and after the 1840s, once the Great Famine effectively performed its task of ethnic cleansing, cleansing of the poorest peasants in Ireland. What Mexico offered during the 19th century was a lot of land, whereas the US by con contrast offered both land and employment. Another issue involved the absence of a critical mass of compatriots, encouraging those at home to follow them and guiding them once they arrived. For example, a lot of, at the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of um, Arabs arrived to Mexico and went to the Istmo de Huantepec, which is in the, in the south of Mexico, in the southern Oaxaca area. And they sent money to their, to their nephews and their sons and so on um, in order to come to Mexico. And these were people who were still in um, what is now Syria and Iraq and so on. And they came and, and populated the, the south of Mexico. These were people of, of Irish, um, Arab descent, but the Irish didn't do that. There was also a problem of compatibilities. The language that was spoken here was not English. The cultural, legal, and indeed social character of the country was not one they, the Irish would have been at home with. Though a few made the necessary, though a few made the necessary efforts and grew to love the general Mexican makeup. There was an addition to perception, whether based on reality or not, that the country practiced an, e an ethic and performed its politics in an alien and an unstable way. Corruption and not adhering to the rule of law are, after all, a great deterrence even to the most desperate emigrant. But simply, the fact that the United, the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and even Argentina were all options on the menu of destinations meant that Mexico was rarely first choice. And then, of course, even if they came here, there was every possibility that sooner or later Irish immigrants would leave anyway and finding the required adjustment too difficult. So, so like the Arabs in the south of Mexico, quite often they would arrive here and within about two generations, they had emigrated to the United States. In more recent times, those who came typically did so because they were invited to take a position here or a business opportunity was, was identified and acted upon. As we saw earlier, earlier, their part to Mexico would have been a contorted one. The Murray family, the Murray family of actors arrived from, nor from Northern Ireland to, to, via Argentina to Mexico. So again, triangulating. They came from Ireland to Argentina and then Mexico. That would be the, the Murray actor family. Uh, the Milmos, who are uh, the family which own Televisa, the Milmos passed from Sligo to the United States and then, and then from there to, down to Mexico. The O'Farrell family, which again, who are involved in media, media as well, they started in the county Longford in the center of Ireland and uh, went to Spain, uh, went to Cuba, and then they came to Mexico. These are all relatively new arrivals, are well known because of their, their success in the field of business. And one sense is they feel at home here. Why would an Irish person feel this way about Mexico? Why would an Irish person feel at home in this country? Let me posit a theory in order to finish this, this presentation. 
Ireland is a country that often suffers from well-concealed lack of self-esteem, a debilitating assessment of itself that is fortified by its habit of comparing itself to its larger neighbouring country, in this case, Great Britain. Tan lejos de Dios, tan cerca de Inglaterra, as a phrase could capture this mentality. Mexico has a similar disposition. Ireland is a country in Europe but does not entirely feel itself European. Its people are first loyal to their country, city or region. Then they, they identify themselves with the country itself. Then perhaps they feel themselves part of the British Isles and after that of the Anglo-American or English speaking world. Somewhere within this mix, mix or perhaps right at the end, they, are, they feel themselves to be Euro Europeans. In an identical way, according to the map, Mexico is part of North America, but many of its people don't genuinely feel themselves to be North Americans. If the two peoples are similar in something, it is, it is perhaps this among others. Although one would like to think that this habit of mind is growing weaker and the major compatible elements has more to do with personality and human feeling. So there we are, that's the, 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 the Irish in Mexico. We've been here more or less since when, since um, Christopher Columbus arrived to, to uh, the Americas. And uh, we are here, as you saw, in relatively sm small numbers. We have been important in, in, in terms of Mexican independence because of uh, William Lamport in the 1640s who wrote the first proclamation of independence. And then the, the signing of, of the Tratado de Cordoba, the Treaty of Cordoba in August 1821 by the son of two Irish people, one of the Lujui O'Reilly. So um, I'm very grateful again to the UNAM for this opportunity to talk about my, my country and its, it, the influence of its people here over the centuries in, on Mexico. And uh, thank you very much for your time um, looking at this presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Murray, for this very interesting talk. It's uh, the, the presence of the Irish in, in my country is very important. I uh, have a better uh, dimension of it now that I have listened to your talk. Thank you very much. I hope our audience has enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, just to, uh, to finish this talk, I would like to ask you if our audience were interested in uh, knowing more, understanding more about this, uh, where could they find more information? Where uh, could you recommend some of your writings to, to our audience so they can know more about this? Yes, I've, I've, I've written about um, this topic and other topics related to it, to it and my, some of my writing is actually in the, in the, um, in the uh, magazine of the Apa Unam, which is obviously it's available on, um, by internet, it's there on, their, on the website of the Apa Unam, That's, uh, it's triple A, uh, P A Unam, so Apa Unam, and you can look up, um, just look up Stephen Murray and you'll find my, some of my articles, but as I said, they're, they're, in, they're in Spanish. Um, John Hogan, a very, very fine academic in, at the, I think he's in the Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara. He's written a lot about this as well, an, an Irish-American Irish academic. Uh, Carlos Mayert as well. Um, you know, we're all, some of us are members of the, the illustrious, illustrious order of St. Patrick here in Mexico. And it always amazes me when I talk to my Mexican colleagues in the, in the same order, how much they know. You know, for example, um, one of them has, is, his name is um, Sanabria Iturbide, and obviously he's very proud of the, his imperial ancestor and so on. But he knows a, a, a fantastic amount of the, the Irish contribution in the 18, in his case, in, in, at, at, the, at the time of um, the first emperor of, of, of um, Mexico in the, eight, in the early 1820s. And so I, as a, a person, very, I'm very interested in this subject. It's, it's astonishing how much, in some respects, how much I know, and then you realize there's so much more to be found out, you know, and, um, and it's almost like you accidentally discovered that a certain individual was doing something in the Yucatan, as I, as I, as I mentioned with, with um, 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 Sierra O'Reilly, and, um, and then the, the, the missionary priests up in the, in the north of the country with the Apaches who were quite often either Irish or of Irish descent and so on. So um, it's, 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 it's always has been a very small group, although the Wikipedia mentions maybe three, between three and 400,000 Mexicans of Irish descent in this country. I, I doubt it, unless it's, one is, is, is being extremely, you know, enormous with the definition of Irish Mexican. Um, 
I, I doubt it. But, but um, the contribution has been very interesting, very, very interesting. And as I said, there is a, a certain amount of, um, there's a sentimental investment by Irish people when they go to, when they go to places. As I said, they went to Argentina and they, they created the, the Argentinian Navy. They went to Uruguay, they did the same thing. They were helping Bolivar. They were helping George Washington when, when the United States was becoming independent from, from uh, the, the British Empire in the 18th century. And, and then they came here and they could have just disappeared, you know, gone to some unknown coastal area of Sonora, Sinaloa at that time, or just disappeared, you know, into these enormous um, uh, underpopulated territories of, of New Mexico and, and Utah and, 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 and Arizona and California. But they decided as a matter of principle, they decided to stay here and fight. And they were usually at, at these battles, which I mentioned, um, in, in, uh, all the way to um, Excomento de Churubusco. And at these battles, they were normally the last pe people to, uh, to retreat or to surrender because they wanted to, they, 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 you know, um, they wanted to put up as, as, as good a fight as possible. And they, and they more or less knew that if they were, if they were captured, they were going to be executed as, um, as traitors. That was going to be the military punishment, almost just about inevitably. So you do find that they, they um, um, you know, they would, there would be a certain amount of argument between the Mexican and, 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 and uh, forces and the St. Patrick's Battalion about when, when was a good time to, to retreat or to, to uh, surrender because the Irish did not want to surrender. And the Mexicans wanted to, wanted to you know, fight another day, but, but you know, you know we, we, we will survive this battle. We would retreat, retreat and fight another day. The Irish wanted to just keep on fighting and, and, and more or less, you know, and sacrifice themselves. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Murray. And uh, I hope that we can continue with this conversation. Um, thank you for your collaboration with UNAM in general, and in particular for today's talk. And we will be looking forward to uh, uh, having you again at our National University of Mexico. Thank you very much again. And thanks to our audience for being with us today with this very interesting topic about our friends, our Irish friends. Thank you. Yes, yeah, same to you. Thank you for your invitation. Best, very best wishes. <laughs>